took our sins to the cross. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, kids, for being here today. I have a confession to make. There's been nothing I've been more nervous about today than Cindy's children's sermon. <laughs> when she first told me what she was planning to do, I, I said, you're going to do what? You're going to bring trash bags in the sanctuary on Easter, and you can put trash bags on the cross? But thank you for this, this memorable illustration of how hard it was for Jesus to put, take our sins to the cross. We thank you for that. And we, we thank you as a congregation for, for being such hard workers, for being such, such wonderful servants throughout this whole Lent season. I know there are some Lutheran churches that are not even doing Lent services anymore on Wednesday nights, but thank you, thank you for all of the help, wonderful Lenten services this year, and all of the soup supper help, and all the help with all the musicians, and all the help with Holy Week, and ambitious Holy Week at the full Seder meal, a wonderful Seder once again as we remember the Last Supper, the roots of our Holy Communion was a Passover meal. And thank you to Pastor Bruce and the musicians, the choir and the worship team for powerfully bringing us to the cross on Good Friday. I, I mentioned on Good Friday that sometimes as Christians we're so eager to get to Easter and to sing hallelujah that we sometimes neglect to really pause at the cross. And we forget that the risen Lord was first the crucified Lord. Somebody told me that they, they've got a friend that tells them they don't like to go to Good Friday services because they're too depressing. Well, of course, if we, if we forget that that's not the end of the story, it would be terribly depressing. It would be horribly depressing. And, of course, there's a difference between depression and grief. I think we're called to grieve as we ponder the cross and we're, we're called to be sorry to, and sad. And, and it's good to be sad. It's good to let ourselves to be sad, to maybe weep a little bit as we consider the, the pain, as Pastor Bruce said, that we're real nails and real blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. And you see, when we do that, that sets us up for the wonder of the resurrection. That sets us up for the miracle and the joy of the empty tomb. As you can imagine, getting ready for Easter can be kind of a little bit stressful for pastors, and pastors can sometimes get a little bit cranky and a little bit snarky and just a little bit, uh, a little bit sn snarky and crabby and everything. So I've got this little video I want to show to you, and I just want to say it's okay for, to laugh. Lutherans do laugh, and it's okay to laugh at pastors here. If you're not careful, you can end up sounding a little bit like this pastor here. Okay, everybody, listen up. This is Easter. Shuttles and golf carts in the parking lot. Now, has everyone in here, staff or volunteer, shared our graphically designed Easter invitation on their personal Instagram? This is for the kingdom. Who is trimming these hedges? A youth intern? For heaven's sakes. No, we don't have ministry time. We do have a petting zoo outside, though. And connect cards, connect cards, connect cards. Do we have the right mixture of haze in the fog machine? I mean, we don't need new members, but did we get the rose petals in the visitor parking spaces? We are pro-Jesus and pro-Easter Bunny. Donuts, check. Coffee, check. Make sure we have gluten-free communion, fat-free communion, Whole30 communion, vegan communion, paleo communion, non-GMO communion. Honestly, everybody needs to keep their phones out because I will be saying some very tweetable quotes this morning. The Easter basket is full, but the tomb is empty. He can put your life back together when it is in pieces, and some of y'all are still focused on Reese's. We need more diversity up on that stage. This is Easter. No, the youth pastor cannot do announcements. What about that one minority guy that came one time? Can we get him to do announcements? We don't want any visitor to feel uncomfortable in any way at any time, but we will ask him to fill out a connect card with their children's names and ages. I don't care what size the stage is, Becky. I need a rapper up there, a full choir, and six men dressed as Roman centurions. Why would you even ask about the worship set list? It's Jesus paid it all, Christ alone, Christ is risen. Can we just, can we get that other worship leader that's a little bit more attractive? This is the best great team we have. Who trained these people? For one Sunday, please, can you just not be weird? Can we put her at the auxiliary door? Quit your ministry, move these people out of here. We got a service starting in 15 minutes. Make sure all the visitors know that they are under no pressure to give, okay? But we'd love to see them come back, and if they do come back, we're starting a series on giving next week. <laughs> I hope I'm not that bad. I hope I'm not that bad. And I want, just for the record, I want you to know that I would never say, could we get a little more attractive worship leader? Because after all, we have Daniel. 
who, how could you do better than Daniel there? But I love it, and I think it's, it's a playful video that helps remind us that if we're not careful, worship on Easter can become a big show, and it can become a big production, and we can end up missing the most important thing, and that is a true and heartfelt encounter with the risen Lord. And that's what we're praying for for this Easter, that we might each have a true and heartfelt encounter with the risen Lord, that our hearts might burn within us, much like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Let's take a closer look at that story. That's Luke chapter 24. If you want to open up your Bibles once again, we'll take a closer look at the story. What did I do with my Bible here? It's going to be around here someplace. Here we go. It's right, right here. Luke 24, you'll find this on page 1520. And I want to pick it up with verse 11. That's near the beginning of the story, at the top of page 1520. And keep your Bibles open, because we're going to walk through this entire chapter here real quickly. And so in verse 11, it says this. Let's read it together. St. Luke writes, But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So we're reminded right away here that even the disciples at first thought it was a fairy tale. Yesterday was the funeral of famous physicist Stephen Hawking, who died about two weeks ago. And he's famous for having written a brief history of time. And he's also a well-known atheist who once said this. He once said that he believed that heaven is a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the dark. I wonder what he's thinking now. I wonder if he's afraid of the dark now. It's unfortunate, isn't it? And it's sad that sometimes our intellect, especially brilliant intellects such as Stephen Hawkins, our intellect can sometimes become a barrier for being open to the things of God and open to the mysteries of the faith. So isn't it noteworthy that Jesus, Jesus says, have the faith of a little child. Have the faith of a little child. He doesn't say have the faith of an astrophysicist because that probably wouldn't work. Have the faith of a little child. That's a better model. I'm reminded of the story of Dr. Eben Alexander. I told you the story about five years ago. Dr. Eben Alexander, although he was baptized and raised Episcopalian as an academic neurosurgeon, he came to believe that there were good, solid, scientific explanations for NDEs. Now, do you know what NDEs are? near-death experiences, until he had one. You see, in 2008, he had a severe case of spinal meningitis. He ended up being in a coma for seven days. They did not expect him to live. But when he woke up miraculously, he started telling stories of his encounter with heaven, the sights and the sounds that were much brighter and more brilliant and dazzling and, and more real than ever anything he had ever experienced in his lifetime here on earth, his encounter with angels. I got a chance to hear Dr. Eben Alexander four years ago in the Twin Cities at a huge Lutheran church, and I thought there was a car accident as I was approaching the church about eight blocks away. There were so many police officers directing traffic. They crammed about 3,000 people into every room in this church with video feeds. And so today, Dr. Alexander says there's nothing more important in his life than telling the story, telling the good news that heaven is real. He's, a, he's an academic neurosurgeon. Heaven is real, that God is real, and that God is love. Isn't that remarkable? Considering that 2,000 years ago, on that first Easter morning, even the disciples at first thought it was a fairy tale. So as we take a look at this story here, I think most Easter's we've probably focused mostly on Easter morning, haven't we? Probably through the years. That, that first Easter morning, it was dark, and the earliest followers came to the tomb, and they found the tomb to be empty. Cindy and I are so excited to be taking a group to the Holy Land next September. We hope more of you will be able to join us. And we're going to be at the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, and we're going to have some devotions there, and we're going to remember this Easter story and read through it and have Holy Communion together there. But you'll notice that there was no singing of Alleluia on that first Easter morning. Isn't that ironic? Here we are 2,000 years later. We're, we're singing Alleluia, but there, there, there were no Alleluias on that first Easter morning. 
But slowly throughout this chapter here, I'm, hope, I'm hoping you're keeping your Bible open to chapter 24. Throughout this story then, slowly you'll see that faith slowly awakens, much like spring is slowly, slowly awakening here in Colorado. Slowly awakening. And so in this story here, at the very beginning, we see that first it's the women at the tomb. And they, they express their wonder at the angel's message. And then there's Peter investigating and pondering what it all meant. And then there's the two followers on the road to Emmaus who encounter the risen Lord. So let's take a look at that story. I don't think I've ever preached on this before. And let's read together verse 30, which is kind of near the end of the story. So page 1521, verse 30, it says this. When he was at the table with them... He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Well, what does that sound like? It kind of sounds like Holy Communion, doesn't it? I mean, it's some of the same verbiage. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Verse 31 then goes on to say, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. You'll notice in most of the Easter stories that the women are a little faster to come to faith than the men. Sorry, guys. Some things have maybe not changed throughout history so much. The women are a little faster to come to faith. In, in this story here in Luke's gospel, it's, it's only Peter alone who, who goes to investigate. And then we read that at the end of verse 12 that he went away wondering to himself what had happened. But there's a big change in this story. What changed the disciples? And as we take a look at how this day unfolds, we see that it's encounters with the risen Lord that changed these disciples. Encounters such as the two on the road to Emmaus. If you go into my office or uh, one of our rooms down the hall in the north end, we have a, I have a famous, that famous rendering of the story of the road to Emmaus. It's, it's a beautiful picture. With, it's a peaceful scene. Because the sun is setting, it's late in the day, they're walking on the road, Jesus is in the middle of the two followers, and his hand is up in the air, and you can see that he is explaining to them what scriptures had said about himself. And so if, if you were to take a look at the little map in your Bible there to the left of the page, you'll see there's a little map. The, the map isn't scaled particularly well because I looked this up. Emmaus is only about seven miles from Jerusalem. So imagine for a moment if we were to, if we were to w walk from services here at Faith Community to Lyons today. That's about seven miles or, or th two times around Lake McIntosh, about seven miles. So about a two-hour walk or so. And so we see that at the end of their visit with Jesus then that... He, their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then verse 39 down the page says, he's, he's, he's trying to convince them that he's real. He says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And then at the bottom of the page, take a look at that. Look at the change here. While he was with them, blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. What a change in these guys. What a transformation from fear to faith, from the horror of the crucifixion to the joy of the resurrection. Let's face it, life can have its horrifying moments, can it? My good friend Matt Vollen, he and his wife Kathy were, were in our wedding, me and Cindy's wedding, 34 years ago. And Matt's a Lutheran pastor up in, in Minnesota now. His wife is too. He recently published a book. You can just get it on Amazon. It's called Sister Secrets, where he tells the story of faith in their family despite the unimaginable heartbreak and tragedy their families had with his two younger sisters. I remember Liz and Cordy well when I was in college. They were still in high school. A couple of beautiful girls, so young and vivacious. But unfortunately, when they got to be adults, they began to battle mental health issues and, and addiction issues. So that tragically, the summer of 2006, Liz was driving and she was fueled by uh, Oxycontin and by uh, too many, too many uh, caffeine pills, and she tragically crashed her car and was killed. The following summer, Cordy, the youngest sister, killed her husband with a shotgun in the kitchen. 
She was married to Steve, a, a, a Lutheran pastor's son, and, and their marriage had been a stormy marriage. And, and that particular day, they had been, they'd been fighting a lot, and finally Steve went out for a motorcycle ride, and when he came back and walked into the kitchen, Cordy was sitting there with a shotgun across her lap, and when he saw the shotgun, he reached for it, and she pulled the trigger and shot him in the chest, which knocked him off his feet. Amazingly, he was able to get back to his feet, and to gaze into his, uh, his wife's eyes one last time, their eyes locked. And she later said that she saw the expression on his face go from shock and horror to an amazing expression of peace and wonder as he looked up and beyond her. So much so that she, she turned around to, to, to look at what he was maybe seeing, and then he dropped to the ground and and bled out and died. We'll never know for sure what Steve saw that changed his expression from horror to an expression of peace and wonder. But we might be reminded as a church of another Stephen in the Bible, another Stephen in the New Testament. In the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, the first martyr in the church, the stoning of Stephen. And as he was dying, do you remember the last part? As he was dying, he looked up into heaven and he said, look, I see the heavens opening up and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. Through the years, I've heard a number of stories from you and, and others and in books of people that have gotten glimpses of God. Glimpses of God at the end of the journey, either in the midst of NDEs or uh, the end of the journey for loved ones. And as you can imagine, as a pastor, I've been at a number of deathbeds. And after that last breath, that last breath, we just see what's left behind, right? We just see that lifeless body that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians as the tent that is left behind, the shell that is left behind. What we don't see is what they're seeing on the other side. About five weeks ago, one of our members sent me a picture of a woman being welcomed in heaven. And I think this picture just beautifully captures the joy on the other side. Isn't that comforting? As we grieve and, and miss our loved ones, our loss, let's remember, our loss is their gain. So on this Easter morning, we pray too. We boldly pray that we too might encounter the risen Lord, that we might see the risen Lord, that we might catch glimpses of God, and that we might share those glimpses with others. So that the, the followers on the road to Damascus, they recognize Jesus in the breaking of bread, and it says that their eyes were opened, and then... He disappeared from their sight. Poof. Did you get that when you read the story yesterday when I sent out the email? He poof. He disappears. And so what do they do? They jump up. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, they didn't hop in their car. This, this, is, this is seven miles, so it's now in the dark. So they're, they're hustling back to Jerusalem in the dark, and then they encounter the other 11, and they're talking about this. And while they were talking about this, verse 36, you can take a look at this. Verse 36, all of a sudden, poof. There he is again. There's Jesus. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. So did, was Jesus shadowing them? Was he following them in the dark? It could have been. Or did he spiritually teleport himself to them? Who, who knows? But suddenly he's there and suddenly he says, peace be with you. Now I ask you, if a dead guy, even somebody you knew, suddenly stood in front of you and said, peace be with you, do you think there'd be peace with you? <laughs> Pro probably not. There'd probably be more like panic with you. So guess what? Take a look at how the disciples reacted. Verse 37, they were startled and frightened. Of course they were, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you so troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? We know that soldiers returning from the battlefield sometimes suffer PTSD, don't they? These are the horrible things they've seen. And I think as we look at this Easter story carefully, we see evidence of PTSD throughout the story, don't we? 
Imagine the disciples, the, the, the blood and the horror, the whipping, the scourging, uh, the mocking. Uh, their, their Savior, their Savior dying on the cross. They're struggling with PTSD on that first Easter. And we see evidence of it over and over again. But something changes them. Something dramatic changes them. And I think it's the, the, the very skepticism of the disciples and Jesus' followers in this story that makes this story so convincing. Let's face it, if they were to make it up, if they were to make it up, don't you think it would be hard for them to resist portraying themselves in a, in a little more flattering manner instead of being so slow to believe and slow to get it and slow to recognize all the evidence? So something transforms this. And we too pray that our eyes might be open to the risen Lord. And so that at the end of the story, in verse 48, it says, Jesus says to them, you are witnesses of these things. You know what you means? You means you. Doesn't, doesn't just mean me. Do, doesn't just mean pastors. You means you. All of us. Jesus' you is for all of us. You. You will be my witnesses. Now, we have a choice today. We can leave here and we can go back to business as usual. Nothing changes in our lives. Or we can take seriously our marching orders that Jesus gives us here. You shall be my witnesses. So I want you to think for a moment of all, all, all of the glimpses of God you've had in your life. All of the answers to prayer. All of, the, all of the examples of where you, you've gone through hard times, experienced healing or experienced the strength of the Lord, helping you in the midst of the hard times. And think about ways that we can, we can openly, honestly, in a natural way to share those glimpses of God with others. Because Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. So Easter invites us to tell the stories where we have seen glimpses of God's amazing grace. Tommy and I went to see the movie, uh, I Can Only Imagine, last Sunday night, and there were a number of you there, and so it was kind of like faith community night at the movies. And, 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 the, and the song, I Can Only Imagine, has been around, what, four, 15 years now or so, it was written by Bart Millard, and he says that he wrote down the words in only about five minutes. Amazing. And, and, and he said, too, that once they figured out that, 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 simple, that simple piano intro to the music, they laid down the music in only about... 10 minutes. Now, the song I can only imagine has become the best selling Christian single in all history. Isn't that amazing? Think about how many funerals you've heard I can only imagine at. All the times we've heard that song, and it's been a carrot crossover song being played in country radio, rock radio, and not just Christian radio, I can only imagine. So in the movie, he tells the backstory of, of what happened there. When he was only about 10, his mother abandoned he, he and his father, and his father was an, left him to be raised by his abusive father, who was just cruel to him and made fun of him and was, was, was mean to him. But then he got cancer when, when Bart was only about 18 years old. But before he died, he came to faith. And something amazing happened. There was a dramatic change in his life. God changed him. God changed him from the mean, cruel, abusive dad that he had been into a humble man of faith. That's what happens when we encounter the risen Lord in our lives. And God changed him from being a mocking, scorning, mean, ridiculing dad, ridiculing his son's love of music, he thought only sissies liked music, to becoming his son's greatest fan. So it was then shortly after his father died that he wrote the song, I can only imagine what my eyes will see. In the midst of a world where there's so much hopelessness sometimes, so much discouragement, so many people battling so many things, getting discouraged, struggling to find hope. In the midst of a world where life can sometimes beat you down, break your heart, steal your crown. We are invited to place our hope and to place our faith boldly in the one who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Now, it's April 1st, but don't be fooled.
One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for your promise that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are. So Jesus, thank you for being right here, risen, Lord, for being in our midst as you are in the midst of the disciples. And as you convince them, please convince us, Lord, may our hearts burn within us. Lord, we pray that we might rise up as a church, that we might rise up as a church and share the stories of where we've caught glimpses of your goodness and glimpses of your grace and, and, and gr glimpses of, of your glory. And so we pray, dear God, to you that we might that we might proclaim your name and the joy of the resurrection. And so we pray to you who are you who is able more than we Im can imaginably ma imagine to do all that we ask and all that we imagine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Amen.